Two, one. Sir, we are live now. Now we can start the session. Okay. Thank you, Marishu. Good morning, everybody. Today we are starting off with another uh, interesting uh, module, which will uh, span over eight to nine weeks. Uh, today, for the first session, uh, we'll discuss about uh, proximal humerus and humeral shaft fractures. Mm, today, um, let me just share my screen. Uh, today, for the first topic, uh, we have Dr. Godasri. She is a clinical fellow at Ortho, uh, OrthoKids. Uh, she'll discuss about the modified well sling uh, technique for infantile humeral shaft fractures. Then, uh, Molin Sir will discuss about the Statue of Liberty manual for reduction, close reduction of proximal humeral fractures. And uh, Thank you. the third, we have uh, Binoti Ma'am. She'll discuss about casting for uh, humeral shaft fractures. Okay, so we, uh, I'll just introduce ma'am and then we'll start. Uh, uh, ma'am is the Associate Professor and Chief of Unit in Sion Hospital and Lokmanit Tilak uh, Municipal Medical College in Mumbai. She did her MBBS and M MS from St. G.S. Medical College and KEM Hospital and uh, did her pediatric orthopedics trainings via various awards and scholarships. And she's published a few books. Uh, amongst the most recent is the Pediatric Orthopedic Trauma, which she co-authored along with other faculty and trauma protocols and techniques. I think it's a very uh, handy book for all of us who uh, regularly practice pediatric trauma. And uh, we want to thank ma'am for accepting our invitation and joining us today. So uh, we'll start with the first talk. Uh, I request Goda to please share yes. the screen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking on modified well sling application. Uh, generally, for fractures around the shoulder and humerus, conventional methods were being used, like adhesive strapping, swaddling, casting, or wrapping of the affected arm to the child's trunk, I mean, to the shirt, of the shirt part of the trunk, or pinning the sleeve to the trunk part. But these had disadvantages like skin irritation, discomfort due to perspiration, excoriation, and uh, further difficulty in nursing as well. To get over these, uh, Mercer Rang described a technique of modified well sling. The advantages of this method or of application of the sling is that the material required is very inexpensive. It is very comfortable for the baby. It is skin friendly, it's easy to apply. And uh, most of the uh, doctors have noticed that parents have high acceptability and high satisfaction rate with well sling. So uh, today I'll be talking about how to apply it. And the materials that are required are one inch stock in it, two safety pins and a scissor obviously to cut the stock in it. So the first step is to measure the length of the sling that is required for the baby. For this, we require three measurements. So one is distance A. That is the distance that is measured from the tip of the affected shoulder. And it goes all around to the opposite shoulder to the opposite nipple line. So this is distance A. The next is distance B. That is, you have to take the length of the affected arm and the forearm. This is B, from the arm to the forearm. The other one is distance C, that is 1.0 times the trunk circumference. So when we add all these together, we get the required length of the well sling. After measuring the length, the next step is to slit the top stock in it so that we'll be able to pass the well around, uh, to, you know, around the arm. So slit the top stock in it till the junction of distances A and B. Simplified, you have to slit it to the distance of A. The entire length of A has to be slit. After that, it is gently uh, taken up, I mean through the arm, and then the A part comes back of the neck and then to the opposite nipple line, which I'll be showing in the video next. So uh, after applying, this is how a well sling looks like. 
and then it is fixed with two safety pins, which I'll be showing in the video again. So this is a sim video which uh, describes how to apply it. So as I told, one we have to measure the distance A, that is from the tip of the shoulder to the opposite nipple line. Here they are cutting the distance A till the junction of A and B with the help of a scissor. And then later they've measured the distance B, that is the length of the arm and the forearm. Then the distance C is 1.5 times the child's chest wall width. So then gently it is wrapped around the patient's arm till the axilla, as seen in the video. And then the cut part is taken behind the neck to the opposite nipple line. After that, a small slit is made so that the hand can come out of that small slit. And then the remaining length, that is the C width, distance C, is wound around the trunk of the child and pinned to the arm with the help of a safety pin. So, this is that length which is got here. The extra excess of the stock in it is being cut. And then a safety pin is applied, one over here, and the other one is applied near the arm. This is quite comfortable to the baby. And how do we do the follow-ups? So the baby is followed in every weekly interval till we feel that there are signs of union, soft callus formation, the baby is able to move the hand well. That is when we remove the sling. Otherwise, we reapply the same sling in weekly intervals. So this is one example of such a child treated with a well-view. And this is a long-term follow-up. So we can see that there's no angulation and there's uh, no uh, limb length discrepancy over here. And this was one publication from our ortho kids clinic, uh, which has studied the long-term follow-up of children treated with modified well-view sling application. So this was published in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics in 2022. It was a retrospective study where 19 infants were studied, seven with clavicle fractures and 12 with humerus fractures. And uh, all of them, except two, except two in the sense they were osteogenesis imperfecta kids and they had some amount of virus angulation and little limb length discrepancy. Apart from that, rest of all the 17 kids had uh, excellent functional outcome results. So thank you. Yeah, so... So Sujit says, uh, can you hear me, Goda? Yes, sir. Okay. So the first question is, Joans, you can moderate your around, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we please, have one. Please take the question. Um, um, Dr. Anil is asking, what age of uh, Velpu sling can be used? And... Another question is, uh, a lot of these children come with sagging of this leg in a week. So any tips to avoid the sagging? So, uh, the Dr. Anil, we have applied this sling till uh, the age of one year. Uh, I, I, I would remember if even a one and a half years old boy, you can apply this sling. Mainly, it has been used for... Uh, Patients with birth trauma or uh, due to manipulation in the massaging and all, where conventionally people used to apply the adhesive taping. And we had seen some skin complications even with micropore and uh, the 
people have tried to put the hand in the in with between the button but that makes feeding very painful while this uh, modified vulpu sling which was developed by mercer rang at uh, sikkit i learned during my training days and i found that very useful uh, sujit i uh, i agree uh, that in one week's time we we call them back because for two reasons one is they they sag uh, the sling sometimes while feeding or while they uh, regurgitate they make it uh, you know uh, bad so you you might like to change it and sagging is better than uh, making a very small hole around the wrist and becoming very tight so you can call them at a week and see whether the fracture has grown many a times in in newborns at one week time they are pain free and we can just uh, put another sling and we can ask family that you can remove it after one week you know at home go there want to take this uh, what is the difference between figure of 8 and vulpu comfort levels uh so well i i think that vulpu is more comfortable than the figure of 8 which creates little bit of tight winding and then uh, compared to the dinoplast which we used uh, i feel well uh, as far as i've seen the cases vulpu is more comfortable to the baby and figure of 8 is applied uh, usually to the clavicle figure, yeah the clavicle the the frag to align the lateral fragment in a way that it would uh, help in remodeling and this children with clavicle fracture they have huge remodeling potential so uh, i i feel vulpu sling gives more comfort it, if you try you will feel that and the moment you put it the the child stops crying uh, yeah so any yeah any more questions uh, if you have any you can share it in the chat uh, then we'll move on to um, humeral proximal humeral shaft reduction maneuvers um, molin sir please share your screen yeah let me see this Can you see my screen, Joans? The PowerPoint has not come in. Okay. Now. So we can't see the PowerPoint. Okay. So let me uh, stop share and reshare. Okay. Stop share or reshare the screen. Yes, sir. Now, yes, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. So, uh, Statue of Liberty maneuver for proximal humerus fracture reduction. Uh, Statue of Liberty is a more fascinating title, but we can. I would tell it is Saha zero position maneuver for. proximal humerus fractures in next few minutes i'll explain to you we know that proximal humerus uh, uh, have tremendous remodeling potential and we very rarely need to treat it or we uh, need to close reduce it so for instance this 4 uh, years old boy came to me of course after 3 weeks of primary injury and the patient was not treated uh initially and then after 3 weeks child presented like this with further collapse and further proximal migration of the distal fragment but one can see the callus on the medial side and so we advise to just wait and watch doing nothing because proximal humerus is a growing hand and it has tremendous remodeling potential and over 3 months 6 months and 1 year it remodeled completely so we know proximal humerus has tremendous remodeling potential and even uh, putting them in a sling will do the job but there are certain indications uh, and uh, 
time where you need to close reduce it and not only close reduce it, if it is unstable, you might need to fix it. Few of the indications are uh, a polytraumatized child or a segmental injury, a floating shoulder or a floating elbow. The one where there is soft tissue interposition, where you, they, uh, the bone fragments uh, cannot be uh, brought together. And finally, an adolescent with limited remodeling potential. We know that this remodeling happens more uh, with more younger children. But if if a same injury x-ray, a 14-year-old boy comes, then he doesn't have much remodeling potential. And then we have to uh, reduce it. So biomechanics, if we see of this fragment displacement, it has been seen that when a surgical neck humerus fracture happens, just or... Salter Harris type 2, the proximal fragment moves a bit internally. It gets adducted and get a bit of uh, uh, flexed also. While the distal fragment, due to pull of pectoralis major, led dorsi and teres major, it gets adducted and rotated internally a little bit which gives an adduction uh, posture or deformity to the fracture fragment. And the deltoid pulls the fragment proximally, which leads to collapse of fracture. And if it is significantly displaced, sometimes biceps tendon can get uh, between the bone fragments. And when you manipulate, you will not feel crepitus because the soft tissue is lying in, in between. So this is the uh, main deformity we see. The distal fragment gets adducted, uh, short, and there is swelling underneath the deltoid because of the bone fragment. Now, what is Statue of Liberty position? This, this, this figure itself shows that it, it is abduction, uh, a bit of uh, uh, neutral rotation, and uh, a bit of extension. This was described by Dr. A.K. Saha from Calcutta in 1957 as zero position. I'm quite fascinated with the biomechanical research done by Professor Saha at Calcutta. And I've been in touch with their, uh, their uh, uh, colleagues. So this is the paper which I would like everyone, all the fellows and trainees to read, that is zero position of the glenohumeral uh, joint and its recognition clinical importance, because this gives you an idea that how this position came in existence. What uh, uh, authors found that when you move the limb in abduction, a neutral rotation, an abduction around 165, all the muscles around shoulder, they stop working and automatically the proximal fragments align with the distal fragment. And this is a maneuver which uh, was used to reduce this sort of fractures. One of the x-rays in their paper shows a similar epiphyseal separation in a young child. And uh, the last figure on your right is a zero position where these, uh, the distal fragment gets aligned with the proximal fragment, both uh, uh, the rotation-wise as well as the sidewise angulation. And in this uh, position, the scapular axis matches with that of humerus. We have Dr. Uh, Professor Paul here from Calcutta University. I've invited him specially and uh, I'll inquire with him a bit in details about this position once I uh, finish this technique. So let's move on to uh, looking at this technique, Statue of Liberty maneuver. Now, uh, this was a six years old boy who fell from height and uh, it led to a fracture and the fragment was lying underneath the skin, which led to, uh, you can see the distal fragment is lying right under, it's an impending open fracture from within. And uh, a bit of abduction and axial view did not reduce the fracture. You can see this contusion and laceration of deltoid, posterior, posterior deltoid, and I could feel the bone fragment underneath the skin where it got necrosed. So first we try to milk the bone fragment from deltoid as we do for supracondylar humerus fracture sometimes. And once I felt a bit pop, I tried to manu manipulate and earlier I could not feel the crepitus, but now I've started feeling the crepitus of bone. A gentle axial skin traction has been given. 
And then I would gradually shift the arm into the Saha zero position by abduction, external rotation, and bit extension. And in this position, invariably, you will see the distal fragment gets aligned with the proximal fragment. And then you try to bring that redu in reduced position back in adduction and see whether it remains. If it is stable, one can apply a sling in that position. But in this case, uh, the moment I would adduct the limb, it will get redisplaced. So I chose to close reduce and then put a pin in this position after confirming the reduction under image intensifier. So you can see abduction. I'm confirming it in the image intensifier. I would increase the abduction till I'm happy. And then I would rotate to make sure the contour of proximal humerus uh, matches that of the distal. And more or less, it ends up, uh, you get reduction in this position where surgeon has to sit down and keep a bit of pressure there. And once you are happy to have this reduction, you can uh, give it to your assistant. It is important to have the patient along the margin of your uh, uh, operation table so that you the head you can see. Now you have to lift the table and you have a, uh, need to have a small stool because you have to pass wire from, from beneath. You have to work like a mechanic. So this is after uh, reduction, anatomic reduction and rotational alignment. Now I'm with a limited painting trapping, I'm passing 1K wire. Now if I have to put another wire, I'll add up the extremity and easily put it. This fracture was stable, uh, so I did not require to put second wire. And uh, this is three years follow-up of the same child where he has full range of external rotation, uh, abduction, and no uh, clinical or radiological limb length discrepancy. And you can see the x-ray is well healed without any evidence of, uh, uh, you know, uh, without any evidence of growth arrest. So thank you very much. So that was all about uh, uh, Saha's zero position. And uh, I would, uh, Joanne, yes. Professor Pal is here. Professor Pal, are you with us? Yes, yes. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for your kind presence. And would you like to brief uh, all of us about how this zero position developed yes. and what are the implications in pediatric fracture management? Yes, uh, good morning to all. Uh, so actually, thank you, Dr. Morlin Shahs, uh, for, for, uh, for enlightening this uh, age-old product, age-old uh, procedure, uh, which is extremely useful for reduction of a very small kid's of the proximal humerus fracture. Not only the proximal humerus fracture on neck, uh, uh, surgical neck, but also any any epiphyseal fracture separation, <clears throat> also any type of fracture which is just uh, proximal to the insertion of the deltoid that can be treated by in this manner. <clears throat> and and, and right, if you have rightly said, sometimes it is seen there is some, uh, the distal fragment is uh, almost it is protruding uh, through the skin and that can lead to some skin uh, irritation and also uh, some significant functional restriction. So uh, you have narrated the indication. Basically what happens, the Dr. Shah's, uh, A.K. Shah's uh, um, technique, actually there are three types of glenoid. Uh, the basically in one type of glenoid, the humeral head is large than the, uh, the, the, uh, the glenoid. And then the second one is the humeral head is absolutely uh, coincides with the glenoid. And third one is the glenoid. Some glenoid is a little bit smaller uh, in respect to the glenoid where the humeral head is basically is going, uh, it is a point contact. When the humeral head is larger, there is a point contact over the, uh, the glenoid labrum. Or the humeral head is smaller than the glenoid. There is a center. It, uh, it touches with the glenoid. So there is another point contact. So basically, what happens because of the point contact, there is a breast stroke movement. Breast stroke movement is a composite movement, which is basically there is some gliding movement as well as some rotational movement, where basically the subscapular disease is the deforming factor, which causes uh, the internal rotation and the displacement of the fracture. Uh, in, uh, in that leads to uh, displacement uh, of the distal fragment of the in, in internal rotated and the proximal fragment is external rotated by the rotator cuff. So uh, what uh, Dr. Shaha actually narrated, so they, they have shown them in mathematical calculation, when the humerus is, is uh, elevated 165 degree, 
in uh, in uh, in the plane of the scapula and a 45 degree uh, that is just in front of the coronal plane so that this medial epicondyle is is looking anterior medially so in this in this position all the uh, uh, this uh, all the functions of the subscapular in the internal rotators and external rotators become zero and uh, at that abducted position the mechanical axis of the shoulder that coincides with the mechanical mechanical axis of the humerus that is humeral shaft pointers towards the spine of the scapula so that there is a absolute cooptation of the humeral uh, head with the uh, uh, glenoid cavity uh, and that there is no rotatory movement basically there is a no rotatory movement rotatory counterpart all the the, the external rotators and interrotators comes into zero position uh, so basically there will be no rotation and it is uh, it is absolutely co-opting with the uh, him, glenoid in in any type of glenoid so basically this is the uh, the highlight the highlighted and so uh, uh, in very small kids it is very difficult to correct that rotation in a, in a, by uh, traction in in the downwards or any any position but once we abduct gradually up to 165 degree and 45 degree in front of the coronal plane uh, so in that case up to 65 degree in abduction is known as the absolute abduction so in that case the whole humerus and the the humeral head comes in a single line and there will be no rotation and dr shah is uh, rightly uh, pointed out so if it is remain unstable so in that case so you can put one k wear and gradually reduce uh, by the side of the body otherwise if it is very it's if some uh, some uh, it is uh, is stable by its uh, uh, configuration of the fracture site you can easily uh, bring it down uh, by the side of the body and you can apply the Belpius technique uh, as you can shown it uh, or any other sling like that mm -hmm. so that will uh, kept till two to three weeks till there is a radiological visible callus is formed so basically this is the uh, dr shahas technique and it is a uh, he has he has given the hunterian lecture in the royal college of surgeons in england in 1958 and ultimately his uh the, this phd thesis has become published it is a very prestigious as we will feel proud of being indian uh, presiding is and professor dp bakshi he has prepared his manuscript on this uh, so this is the excellent uh, maneuver. I'm very much uh, delighted uh, and uh, very obliged to Dr. Maulun Shah for presenting this uh, Statue of Liberty position uh, for a uh, reduction maneuver of this proximal humerus. So not only the neck, hum neck humerus, but also the, the uh, any epiphyseal separation of the humerus as also any type any proximal humerus fracture which is uh, proximal to the insertion of the deltoid that can be treated in this manner. Thank you, Dr. Molisha. Yeah, thank you very much for your kindly, uh, um, your time and uh, description. So I'm going to share this paper with all the fellows and uh, those who are interested in shoulder biomechanics, they must read it. The other day I read another paper from Brazil where they do close reduction of shoulder joint with the same maneuver. So it's a great uh, help. And uh, the proximal humeral physis is a pyramidal shaped physis. So many a times, as Dr. Paul said, once you reduce it, it will become stable and it will not let the fragment move and there you can conserve it. Yeah, so if there is no uh, any question or we can move ahead. Yeah, yes, sir. I'll sir. stop here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for the great presentation. Thank you, uh, Kishore Paul, sir, for joining in. Thank and, you. Uh, we don't have any questions as of now. So uh, we'll go on to the last topic. Uh, ma'am, you can share your screen. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So at the outset, let me thank uh, Maulin for inviting me. Uh, it's always uh, nice to be a part of this wonderful uh, academic activity. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yeah. So from the proximal humerus, now we move a little down to the humerus shaft. And uh, as you know, it's not a very, very common fracture. It's only about 5% of all childhood fractures. But the good part is that vast majority are amenable to conservative treatment. 
when you look at the x-ray, I think uh, all the adult surgeons are always tempted to, you know, surgically treat this because, you know, you see them quite displaced and comminuted. But let me tell you that it is all conservative treatment, which le leads to a wonderful outcome. And why is it so? Because of these three reasons. As we know, upper limb is non-weight bearing and hence anatomical alignment is not always necessary for functional restoration. Even if you have a little bit of malunion, the shoulder motion, the elbow flexion extension and the forearm rotations will effectively compensate for any mild to moderate humeral deformity. And hence, you can accept to some extent some amount of malalignment and we'll see that later. And also, as Maulin mentioned, there is considerable remodeling potential for humeral deformities because almost 80% growth of humerus occurs from the proximal physis. So even if a fracture mal unites over a period of time till the child attains skeletal maturity, there's going to be significant remodeling. So in humerus shaft fracture, almost 20 to 30 degrees of virus, 20 degrees of apex anterior angulation, about 15 degrees of internal rotation and one to two centimeter of shortening is well accepted. So as I tell my residents always in children fractures, it's not an anatomical reduction, but you have to have the acceptable reduction, especially when you are talking about the diaphyseal fractures. So the only indication or maybe a relative contraindication for conservative treatment would be when there is an open fracture or if there is associated vascular injury or if there is a diaphyseal fracture with grotely unacceptable alignment. These are the only cases where you'll do a surgical intervention. Otherwise, almost all fractures, and in fact, some of the stress fractures or even pathological fractures can be well treated by conservative methods. <laughs> And one of the most important way of treating is by this hanging arm cast, which was described by Caldwell in 1933. So it can be uh, uh, implemented for the initial management of the humerus shaft fracture. And it works by two, two principles. It immobilizes the fracture, especially when it is in the middle or the lower third. And it also at the same time gives gravity traction. So it is not only immobilizing, but giving a continuous traction also. So this is a simple above elbow cast, but the specific application of the loops just above the level of the wrist can help you adjust the coronal and the sagittal malalignment. So let me explain to this, explain in this beautiful diagram. So as you can see in this, once you have applied the above elbow cast, you check your C arm and if there is a residual anterior angulation, you can decrease the length of this sling by which is applied through this loop on the radial border and that will lead to a restoration of the or rather correct the anterior angulation and restore the sagittal malalignment. As against that, on your C arm, if you see that there is a residual posterior angulation, then you increase the length of the sling and that will correct the posterior angulation and align the fracture in the uh, sagittal plane. Similarly, if you have a coronal malalignment, when you check your X-ray on, uh, you check under C arm, then what you can do if there is a lateral angulation, then there is this loop which is attached on the dorsal aspect of the uh, wrist joint, just above the wrist joint, and that will correct your lateral angulation. And if there is a medial angulation, you apply the sling on the volar aspect of the cast. We will see that on the video. So these way by adjusting the loops and the sling length, you can adjust the coronal and the rotation uh, uh, sagittal plane malalignments. So uh, this is a hanging cast. So it is applied with the child in an upright position. It's an above elbow cast. You apply the stockinet, you apply your soft roll, the position of the elbow is at 90 degrees and the forearm is in neutral position. Remember that your uh, cast should not be very heavy weight because otherwise the weight of the cast will make the child more uh, uncomfortable. So even you can even use an arctic cast. Once you applied the above elbow cast, this are the slings which I was talking about. So here for the demonstration purpose, I have applied big slings. 
but just above the level of the wrist, you have three loops, okay? One is on the radial border, the other one is on the molar aspect, and the one is on the dorsal aspect. And these loops are going to be secured with a plaster at this level. So then they are firm. So as I mentioned, this radial loop and the sling applied through that will adjust your sagittal mal alignment. So decreasing and increasing the length of the sling applied through this loop can adjust your anterior or posterior, uh, posterior angulation. And the volar and the dorsal loops once they can help you adjust the coronal malalignment. So this loops will be secured with a plaster. So ideally the upper end of the cast should be about an inch above your fracture site. If the fracture uh, site permits that because then that will not only give the gravity traction, but also immobilize the fracture to some extent. So once you have secured all the loops, then you apply a sling through that, attach it around the shoulder. You check the position of the fracture, the reduction, what is achieved. And then as I showed you in the diagram, you can adjust the length and the site of the loop to correct your coronal and sagittal malalignments. So as you see, if you apply the sling on the dorsal, it is going to pronate the forearm to some extent and that will correct your lateral angulation. Similarly, if you apply on the volar aspect, it will supinate to some extent and will correct your medial angulation. So uh, some of the disadvantage of this hanging arm cast is that because you're going to uh, immobilize it for long, it may lead to a little bit of shoulder and elbow stiffness. But as we know, in children, it's not much of an issue. They get their range pretty fast. But the main concern is maintaining the erect position because it's a hanging arm cast. The child has to be in erect position most of the time during the day and also sleep erect or semi-erect or in a reclining position. So some amount of compliance issue is there because the child has to be erect for it to act. Otherwise, the hanging arm cast and the traction, gravity traction does not work. So conservative treatment using this hanging arm cast is good, but it is challenging, not only for surgeon, but also for patient. You have to have frequent follow-up to identify any early loss of alignment, and you need to readjust your sling and the loops. And for the patients, they have to follow the guidelines and maintain the cast as per the instruction in order to, for it to be successful. Let us see some examples of some fractures treated by this hanging arm cast. So this is a, a mid-shaft transverse humerus fracture, a little bit angulation displacement. It was treated by this cast. As you can see, uh, as I told you earlier, if the cast extends above the level of the fracture, then it is going to immobilize and give traction. Fairly good alignment. We could adjust it with the help of the loops. And this was healing well at two weeks, at four weeks, pretty well. And then he was converted into a brace, humerus brace. Another case uniting with a hanging arm cast and having a beautiful reduction and finally remodel at the level of uh, at uh, skeletal maturity. Even uh, cases like this, which are communicated, can even, even be treated by this hanging arm cast. You need not do any operative intervention. And this was at four weeks, uniting well in a fairly good acceptable alignment. And this was at six weeks and again, remodeled well. So conservative treatment for humerus shaft fracture is effective in majority of shaft fractures. But the successful outcome depends on a good casting technique and also regular monitoring of the cast by the surgeon and also compliance of the patient by properly following the instructions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, uh, first is, uh, ma'am, how to assess and maintain the rotation while applying the cast? So rotation control will not be possible uh, with this, but... Uh, as we know, there will be some amount of internal rotation. 
but uh, that does not have, as I told you, any functional implications. So you cannot exactly control the rotation. But sometimes if you, if there is excessive internal rotation, you can put some, you know, uh, additional padding under the axilla to make it into little external rotation. But rotational control, I understand, is a limitation and you cannot control effectively as you can control the other maneuvers. Okay, ma'am. Uh, next is, uh, ma'am, how to take x-rays in hanging position to see the sagittal alignment? So you can rotate the C-arm. Now you have, uh, you can put it in a oblique position in a, how we do sometimes shoot through and other things. You have O-arms also. So it is possible. You can take it, you know, uh, rotate the C-arm and do from side to side. You can, it's possible. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, the loops, ma'am, uh, is it made from bandage or from stockinette? You can make either ways. I have I had made it from a stock in it, but you can make it even from a bandage and uh, uh, mainly secure it in a proper position. Well, it is not mandatory that you have to use one material over the other. Okay. Ma'am, when do you remove the cast? So uh, depends on how compliant the patients are. Initial two three weeks till the time the fracture becomes gummy. Again, depends on the age. The younger the child, they will start uh, uh, uniting faster. You can shift to a, a, a brace or something where you can start mobilizing the elbow. So how compliant the patient is and what is the age of the child, how it, well it is uniting. Initial two, three weeks, it is important so that you have, a, it starts uniting and then you can convert to some other modality. You can put functional cast brace or a, 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 a brace per se and start mobilizing. Okay, ma'am. Um, uh, age limits for the hanging curse? There's no age limit. Uh, in fact, uh, when it was described, it was described for even uh, adults, this method, you know, earlier days when there were not much of operative techniques, these uh, things were described even for adults. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Professor Ananda Pal may be aware of this at, uh, you know, uh, at, at their place maybe. This is a good way of uh, treating a humerus shaft fracture. Okay, uh, Ma'am, uh, did you uh, require any time to uh, abandon the cast and uh, proceed for a surgical management? Uh, uh, you have, yeah, as I said, uh, you have to have certain limitation of acceptable alignment if it's going well beyond that. And if it is not getting maintained or the child is not compliant, then maybe you have to switch more, more so in the adolescent or the children nearing maturity. If they are younger, you can still uh, accept. Okay, ma'am. Ma uh, last question. Uh, a child needs to be upright for how many hours? So actually, actually maximum time of the day because the moment he lies down, the because it's not a rigid fixation, right? We are not immobilizing any joint above the fracture site. So it's all for it to act as a hanging cast, you have to have the gravity traction. So that's the problem, you know, because child has to be upright most of the time. And in fact, recommended that they sleep also in a reclining or you know semi red position rather than sleep because then the whole effect will go whatever reduction you have tried to achieve through the cast may get lost so maximum time of the day and night it is recommended to be upright for it to act as a hanging cast and the traction to work yes, yes professor Yes, uh, that's really it is very good technique. Just I want to highlight uh, one, two minute technical points uh, regarding the uh, rotation. Yes, it is not uh, very difficult. It is very difficult to correct that complete rotation. But what I modify this <clears throat> in two ways. One is uh, the, once you mold the cast along the epicondyles of the humerus and make the anteroposterior diameter of the cast is little bit more than the side to side diameter. So it is almost it is a oh, anteroposterior oval type. So that will make little bit uh, restriction of uh, say gross uh, rotational restriction. That is one. Second, uh, the the once we applied the cast on the arm position, we will keep little bit valgus. That means uh, keep the uh, elbow little bit uh, valgus deliberately in the cast position so that that will prevent the distal fragment to go in the various position. So the, this modification I actually add in, in this uh, technique so that will help uh, to prevent the gross rotation and also the uh, gross various um, malposition of the fragment. Okay. Yeah. Very good points. I think thank you sir for uh, adding that. Dr. Okay. Binodhi, uh, 
uh, it would be great if you can share that uh, paper. If you sure. Have, so yeah, I will do that. Share with the fellows. Yes, I will do that. And uh, I think Gaurav asked one question that can uh, about the patient which we treated. Is it right, Gaurav? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can treat those patients after a close reduction by just by putting them in a slab. If you, when you do adduction, it remains uh, it remains reduced. Many a times, the moment you adduct, the muscle forces come to play, especially when there is a combination on the lateral side and the type of fracture. Sometimes if it is getting displaced, then you need to put a wire. And uh, if it remains stable, then you can immobilize. That happens in some children where they have a pyramidal growth plate. So it, it will itself, it will become a, uh, it will hold it in that position. So right. my, sir, my question was like in, as I, as I was seeing your position of reduction, it was somewhere around 100, 110 degrees of abduction uh -huh. and neutral to a little more of external rotation. So the way we apply uh, abduction, external rotation, uh, shoulder spikers, can we uh -huh. keep it in that position and it, without is, a wire? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, now there is a chance of uh, axillary nerve stretch. You know, you cannot keep that thing. Uh, the Statue of Liberty position has also been questioned by a few trauma surgeons and they have seen some axillary neuropraxia. So that is a reduction maneuver where you achieve the reduction, but the resting position uh, can lead to. Now I see, I, I saw a paper of uh, uh, post-operative uh, immobilization. Uh, Dr. Pal, you can throw a light that they keep it in a uh, statue of Liberty or Saha zero position and then gradually they bring down. But in pediatric uh, literature, I found that uh, they do not advocate immobilization in that position because it can hamper axillary nerve. What is your view? Yes, absolutely right. Uh, yes. Actually, Dr. Shaha, they, they have used uh, that, uh, to keep that position in a very unstable situation uh, where there was no provision of putting the K-ware. So they actually, he advocated to keep that position maintained by giving either traction or in a shoulder spike for only for two to three weeks followed by he reduced the position by the side of the uh, body but um, in our um, nowadays it is very easy to put a k-ware so the, as uh, you were rightly mentioned if it is a uh, remain unstable then in, in the in that position you can put a one k-ware and uh, that gives in the center of the physis that will not hamper the growth in the later part uh, later on and that is easy to keep that position i think so that was Gaurav used for conservative treatment of rotator cuff tears as well. Uh, because now we have all arthroscopic repair available in the good olden days. They used to treat it in zero position for two weeks. Then they will bring down to 45 degree abduction and they'll bring further down over one month. But now with fractures, we can uh, just put a wire and that will that is easier. The only thing is... Uh, your starting point should be little distal that you don't uh, and only one you check in all the views because many a times people they go out of the fracture site and go in the axilla where they can injure axillary nerve. So once you put the wire in distal fragment, you check in all the rotation, confirm the reduction, you move your image intensifier, not the arm and then only one go you should put the wire. Most of the time, only one wire will uh, reduce the fracture and then you can check the step. We, have, we do not want absolute 100% uh, alignment because it has great remodeling potential, but it should be reasonably aligned. That's, that's the goal. Absolutely. Absolutely right, sir. So I think, uh, Joanne, we can yes. conclude this meeting if there is no more question. I And I before we conclude, uh, Dr. Paul, thanks for your time. Thank and, you. Uh, the tips you gave will be of great use. Thanks, Binoti, ma'am, for, uh, for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I don't know why I'm, I'm not seeing myself. Uh, my, can you see me? No, we cannot see you. Ah, I don't know what is happening. They do, The Zoom don't want me to... Demonstrate, but anyway, no issues. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, Joyce, you can okay. conclude. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, I would like to thank all the faculty for uh, the wonderful presentations and uh, Kishore Pal, sir, for the uh, tricks okay. he added. Um, next week, next Saturday, we'll meet with a session on supracondylar fractures. Uh, hope to see you next time. Uh, have a wonderful day and weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.